You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. And my name is Rob. Happy whatever day it is for you. It is actually, what day is it here? It's Tuesday. Glad to be with you. Glad you're with us. Thank you very much, as always, for spending a few minutes of your day with us. Totally. And I hope you're getting ready for your Part 107 recency exam as that becomes more and more prevalent for more and more pilots. Don't forget, you have to renew within two calendar years of the day that you took the exam. So if you took the exam October 1st, you have until October 1st to take your recency exam, which you can schedule at catstest.com. Today's question of the Part 107 recency exam is again brought to you by our friends and family at the Drone U community. You can join this inspirational and motivational community as you have access to over 33 classes to help expand your drone business or just turn your passion into profit. You can check out that community and go to droneu.education. Today's question, a small UA must be operated in a manner which A, does not endanger the life of or property of another. B, requires more than one visual observer. C, never exceeds 200 feet. Hmm. Rob? That would be A. The answer is A, a small UA must be operated in a manner which does not endanger the life or property of another. Here's a simple, simple, easy one. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. That's a setup if I've ever heard one. (laughs) He, you know me too well. This is not fun anymore for me. <laughs> I need a change. According to 14 CFR Part 107, what is the maximum ground speed for a small UA? 87 knots, 87 miles per hour, or 100 knots? <laughs> I actually have zero idea, but I have a 33% chance. So let's say 100 knots. The answer, me. Oh shoot! <laughs> the answer is a eighty-seven knots, which is about equal to one hundred miles per hour. But one hundred miles per hour was not listed as an answer. So it's a bit of a trick question. Oh, they're trying to trick you up. Yeah, for sure. So I'll say it one more time, just to make sure you guys remember it properly. According to fourteen CFR Part One Hundred Seven, what is the maximum ground speed for a small UA? Eighty-seven knots, eighty-seven miles per hour, or a hundred knots? The answer is eighty-seven knots. All right. Right on. Today's gonna be a fun, controversial show. Yeah, that long pause is there for for a reason. Um, we're gonna be talking about drone jobbing companies. It's a way for new guys to get up in the industry. But it's increasingly becoming problematic for drone guys who actually care about safety and providing quality deliverables and, well, lots of other things. I've even had a couple of drone jobbing companies recently poach one of my three clients that I service, and it was uh, rather fun, to say the least. Why? Because this company was extremely pushy and persistent, but they did get to show me what deliverables they provide to the client. So with that, I was able to kind of tweak a recent deliverable as of yesterday, literally, as of yesterday. Is that? Wow. Uh, I'll show you. So I had to essentially change what I was doing because he wanted this very commercial look, even though he didn't understand some of the, um, how do I say this, some of the nuances of a quality pilot. So we're going to be talking today about how do you fight back against these drone jobbing companies that could potentially be poaching your clients? What can you do with your clients? And how can you negate this? There's a couple strategies here that are really important, and we're going to go into all of them. Hey, Paul and Rob. This is Kevin in New York. I've been an aerial photographer for almost 30 years, both manned and unmanned. I've gotten into the unmanned game about the last four or five years, operating under a Section 333 now as a Part 107 pilot. So I have a lot of clients, uh, trusted clients, who've been using my services over the years. And now I'm starting to see startups such as drone base and drone genuity just swoop in and undercut everybody there uh just you guys are a couple of smart guys i just want to know what your take is on this and how would you approach your clients who are about to be poached by these newbies on the block 
Thank you very much. Can't wait to hear your response. Kevin, thank you for the question. Congrats. It sounds like you've actually done a good job of getting into the industry early and then building a, a good business. So um, I'll just start by saying with that foundation, you're going to be fine. But I'm definitely curious to hear your thoughts on this, Paul. Um, well, you know, in part of our recent uh, class filming, we've been really kind of taking a new, more structured kind of feel with each class, talking about like what we're going to go over in this video, what they can expect to learn, and then recapping it at the end of each video after the help of uh, of one of our new producers who actually has a master's in education and and education delivery. So my point in saying this is that uh, I think there's a couple strategies that are important. Strategy number one is relationship building because this is always going to trump everything, no matter what. Nepotism is real, and if you don't believe that, it's time to get off your high horse because it's real. Uh, Number two, our strategy number two is client education. We'll talk about this as well. And client number three is is one of parts one and two in addition to another piece, which not only is about, you know, client education and it's not only about building relationships, but is also about adapting your product to help match the look. You know, you may have a client that loves the look of something and understands what you do has a unique feel, but they still may want that little thing just because it looks credible and it looks good how it's being presented to them from your competitor. So quick story. I recently had um, a drone uh, jobbing company poach one of my clients. Um, it was drone base. And wait, I mean, wait, did they poach or they attempted to poach? They attempted to poach. I think that's a good that's a good uh, clarification. And you, I mean, now why did they poach my guy? No other reason other than I'm sure they saw something drone related on their page and they loved using a drone site and they probably understand that maybe working with operators is not the most easy and convenient uh, system to augment their existing company, which is a good lesson for us drone operators, guys. Make it as easy and convenient as possible to work with these people because the easier you make it for them, the easier they're going to make it for you. They're going to look out for you, give you jobs. This, I mean, this ideology is as prevalent as your ability to go to the bank in the drive-up line. Do you have your driver's license ready to go with your debit card and your check already signed with a deposit slip? Because you know if you already have those things that your time in the drive-up line is going to be one third or one fourth of everyone else who's trying to get their crap together. I mean, it's so funny because I think of that example also as an analogy for Mm -hmm. um, entitlement for baby boomers, but I'm not going down that road today. So anyway, long story short, the more, the easier that you make it for people to work with you, obviously more people are going to work with you. So that's a very important lesson. Um, Point number two, DroneBase was really good at attempting to poach my client because they reached out to him almost daily. They emailed him daily with um, email series number one. Here's what we typically provide to our clients, and here's testimonials of what's worked for them. Email number two was, here's what we typically provide to our clients. Check it out. This is typically what you can expect to get. And yes, they did have a great viewer to view photos and view maps of things. And you know, I know Eagle View is a great thing for roofers because they've done what drone pilots have failed to do, which is create systems to conveniently deliver what they can to their client. This is why those companies have come to fruition. So I think this is a good lesson for us drone pilots. But as companies like DroneBase, as companies like um, Uplift, which is another good one, I think Uplift and DroneBase are probably the, the best two right now. They are actively pushing, you know, and marketing against all kinds of clients. What can you do to counter that? Number one, you have to build really, really intense, good relationships where people care more about you than they do about who's trying to reach out to them to essentially take your job. Uh, again, the perfect example of this, I'm going to go back to PJ Kirkpatrick of Terra Vigilis. Uh, he, he's the number one systems guy, number one follow-up guy, will always tell you thank you, is full of gratitude in everything that he does, and he's someone that you just deeply want to be around because number one, you know things are getting done, but he also showcases appreciation and gratitude in everything that he does. And like it's, it's just like you, Rob. Uncompromisingly so. He, yes. He doesn't waver. He's the perfect example you, of the person that the book Give and Take demonstrates how you should be. Mm-hmm. The book by it's Adam true. Grant. And it shows. So when you're building these relationships and you after you have a meeting with someone, don't be afraid to send them a card and a $5 gift card to Starbucks. Don't be afraid to send them a gluten-free muffin. Don't be afraid to send them just a simple thank you and a t-shirt from wherever you are. These little acts of kindness do wonders. 
but you cannot have the mentality that if you do something, they have to help you back out. That's one of the big things they talk right. about in the book is you cannot be a matcher. You cannot do things with the expectation of, of you expecting something back. And the perfect example of being a matcher is when a company gives you a bunch of baseball tickets and they say, hey, we have this suite every year that we buy and we give tickets to our clients. In a poll, a lot of people have found that they typically don't like to take those gifts because someone is expecting something in return. Hmm. So if you are ever giving off the subconscious behavioral or uh, body language or by something you say or by something that you write in a card that you're expecting something back, you might as well not start in the first place because you should be unwaveringly give, giving. Right. And that's a hard thing to achieve. I mean, that really has to be, if I may, a heart issue um, or uh, it starts it starts deep within you because you're not going to fool people. Right. And the reality is some of that you I mean, you are doing it because you want to generate a relationship. You want to build a relationship, which is going to lead to mutually beneficial um, transactions, if you will. So it's something to work on as far as your, your mindset, because and starting with, you know, reading books like that and just training yourself to mm-hmm. have that mindset because people can read through if you're trying to fake it. Yeah, the, yeah, being there was a study and Freakonomics talked about it in the of uh, the it's so crazy. Did you know that a doctor's propensity to get sued depends on the treatment and and genuineness of their um, experience in the waiting room before the appointment? Before you ever see the doctor? Before you ever see the doctor. Wow. No, I didn't know that. I was th- I thought you were going to get into bedside manner of doctors, but you're saying before you ever oh, even contact them. Oh, it's before them. you even contact them. Very interesting. Isn't that, I did not know that. Yeah. So how you treat people, how you say things, quintessentially the most important thing. Okay. So strategy number two is educating your client. You know, I've talked negatively about taking too much time to educate your clients. It's something that we've talked about in the book, How to Be a Rainmaker. In today's day and age, where this technology is so far ahead of people, there's a degree in which you have to educate your client. But there's also a point where you need to educate very specifically the differences between your work and your competitor's work, which means that if you have to download that work and then show them very clearly, like, this is jerkiness, this is jerkiness, this is bad, like, this is bad because of this light. Here's an example of what this would look like if it was done properly. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but if you can create one video and showcase it in all your presentations, which I have been doing since 2013, it's still in my roofing presentation. I show someone what it's like to actually go through and correct an image and make it look good. The things that you have to know. Um, But recently, and this is the third point, that if you're not educating your clients on those nuanced differences, then the third point is you may have to pivot your deliverable to help match the needs of your client. So when my client saw this little, in fact, here's a great example, just this little pin drop on a map to help showcase the, the size of something, I went to Motion VFX, I downloaded a bunch of different plugins to literally find the things that he was looking at and then put them in my video and even did some tracking in the video to make it look even better. Hmm. So I had to pivot a little bit in order to retain the client, but that's right. fine. That's another couple hours of my time. Is it a, a sunk cost? It sure is. But at the end of the day, it's going to keep the client, which is 10 times more important. So Yeah, totally. I think um, it brings up a great point. You said flexibility. I think you mentioned at the beginning of your answer that adaptability is really important. I think as it relates to this subject, it's obviously a big issue for um, for drone pilots because I think the vast majority of drone pilots, at least those that we interact with, they don't want to build a business. In fact, I don't know that it's possible, but build a business based upon something uh, like drone base. We've talked about how drone base can be great for um, getting some of your first jobs and learning, and that's how I would I would treat it. Obviously, you're you're past that, Kevin. But what it makes me think about for somebody like you is that you're going to have to become more efficient. Mm-hmm. So it should be motivation for improving your systems and your way of doing things because it's just a function of capitalism and the way the system works that. Prices get driven down, generally speaking, because of the competition and because of newer and better and faster ways of doing things. Well, that applies to you, whether they're trying to poach your business or not. So that's something that comes to mind. I think that, uh, yeah, just understanding that reality 
and not being afraid of it. I'm not saying you're afraid of it, but um, just sort of um, embracing that that's the reality that we live in, figuring out how you can do things better, building those relationships, understanding that they're probably going to be successful in poaching one or two or more clients. And not necessarily being okay with that, continue to be motivated by that, but don't be broken by that because it is going to happen. You can't stop it, but you can mitigate against it and in fact build deeper relationships with those clients that spend more time with you and continue to give you their business. So it doesn't have to be a negative, but it is a reality. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Wow. So build relationships, educate your client on nuanced differences, do it in a way that can be shown to multiple clients. So that way you create a system so that you can combat this at scale. Also make sure that you are reaching out to clients continually to build those relationships. That way you're never out of their mind, whether that's your newsletter or sending them a quarterly gift or whatever it is, figure out a way that way you can scale it as well. And then third, be open to pivoting. If you have to showcase an image with certain graphical assets on it, that's fine. Find someone on Fiverr who will take your aerial images, add graphics on them and pop them back to you. It's really not that hard. And I would even suggest do one, two, or a few jobs for these companies. Understand what they're doing. Learn the ways that they're communicating with clients, et cetera, what their deliverables are, like Paul ran into, and educate yourself on how they're doing it because um, they're having success and they're having success for a reason. So there are things to learn from them. I could not agree more with that last statement. The other thing that I would like to mention that I'm disappointed I didn't mention earlier is pricing theory. Mm. Pricing theory is really powerful. There's a good episode on pricing theory from um, Reed Hoffman's um, Masters of Skill podcast where he talks about pricing theory. But pricing theory is really powerful because people do pay a lot of money for super expensive items simply because they expect a greater level of service, a greater level of deliverable, and a greater level of overall experience. Um, if you price something very low, clients are going to wonder, honest, like in, in something other than real estate, clients are going to wonder and question themselves, I wonder why this is so cheap. So that you have to understand there's a scale of pricing mm -hmm. from way too expensive to way too cheap. And it also, again, depends on your audience. So don't forget about this. Do you really want to be fighting to keep the little guy realtors that will no matter what chop you and or uh, knife you in the back? Probably not. But if you have luxury realtors who have certain types of homes and you always want to work with them and create a lasting relationship. And they appreciate your value. Mm -hmm, then that's how you're going to do it. Yep. So Totally. Anyway, uh, I think that's going to do it for us today. If you have a question, don't forget to ask your question. Go to askdroneu.com. We love business questions, deep mapping questions. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, uh, if you go to, let me just make sure I've got this right. I think it's bit.ly forward slash drone mapping classes. So that's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash drone mapping classes. And you can check out our full schedule of mapping classes and where they are going to be in the country. Check them out again, bit.ly forward slash drone mapping classes. That's going to do it for us today, guys. Thanks again for listening. Really do appreciate it. Really appreciate those reviews. If you want to leave us a review to help someone else find the show, we would greatly appreciate that. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You. Oh, <laughs>